O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste, Make haste to help, help me, O Lord. Glory be, be to, the to the Father, and to the, the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, the love of our salvation. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up, when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our continuous reading of the Passion History takes us this evening to John chapter 19. So they delivered Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. 
Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer is our focus on this Lenten evening. It's printed for you on the front of your worship folder. Let's take a moment to recite the petition together. Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, 
animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. This petition for daily bread stands right in the center of the Our Father, the fourth of seven petitions. Hence, it is a hinge petition coming after our prayer for God's name to be placed upon us, his kingdom to come among us, and his will to be done within us, and flowing then directly into petitions for forgiveness, protection from temptation, and deliverance from the evil one. Give us this day our daily bread is both central and fourth. Its centrality tells us that bread is not unimportant to our Father in heaven. He knows what you need even before you ask him. It's the nature of God's fatherhood that he daily and richly provides us with all that we need to support this, body, this bodily life. His fatherly goodness and mercy compel him then to provide for his created creatures. And the fact that this petition for bread comes in fourth place tells us that bread has its place, rightful place in God's order of things, but it's not first. He does indeed preserve and protect life, not simply because he created it, but ultimately in order to save it for eternity. And so he feeds the unbeliever, so that the unbeliever might repent and believe. That's God's will. And so the disciple, you, me, people who trust in God for every good gift, know God to be a good and gracious Father. And since we know that about him, well, here's our problem, you see. We have this problem with worry, anxiety about stuff, about food or drink or clothing. That's so wrong. Anxiety only belongs in the realm of the unbeliever who doesn't know that God is good all the time. In fact, Jesus says to his disciples, and thus subsequently to you and me, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Jesus warns that the anxiety of unbelief is that nervous liturgy that rises when our false gods have, prepared, have failed to provide for us. Or I like the way one other smart person once said it, worry mounts in direct proportion to self-trust. Jesus says, you know, the Gentiles seek all of these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, so seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things are yours as well. Therefore then, the agenda for prayer as Jesus teaches us to pray is this. To seek God's name first with, on our lips and in our lives. To seek God's kingdom as he lords Jesus' death and resurrection over us. Seek God's will to save over and against his will, uh, over against the will of the devil, the world, and our flesh that are only out, as Jesus says in another place, to steal and kill and destroy When we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of these other things are already ours. That's God's promise. He provides them. No believer in God's promise should ever say, you know, I need to make sure my bank account is in order. I need to make sure my work is in order. I need to put bread on my table first, and then, then I can attend to the things that God wants me to attend to that come from his gracious hand. That's just backwards and upside down. That's the way of unfaith. Jesus says, if you want to know what's good and right and proper, take a look at the lilies of the field or the birds of the air or the grass. None of those things can or do they pray. And yet also they are provided for by the Father in heaven. They don't worry about those things. But what about those 
who are his foremost creatures, those whose lives are worth the blood of his son shed on the cross, don't you think we should be ones who are not people of little faith? That God is good and gracious to us all the time. God gives daily bread indeed without our prayer, Luther teaches us, even to all wicked people. But we need to learn again and again and again because we're caught up in this thing called this broken, sinful world, and we have this tension between us, inside of us all the time, one time, at the same time, sinner and saint, and that tension's always there trying to vie for position of power in our lives, and we are always given to want to worry. How frantic were you today with the prospect of another stimulus check maybe coming to your bank account? There's been all kinds of warnings out there about if you're across such and such a threshold of earning, you may or may not get one, and is it really going to come, and when are you going to get it, and then what happens to the other things that happen, and we get all fraught up in the things, but has God changed? Has his mercy been relenting because a stimulus check may or may not find its way to your bank account? Has his forgiveness lessened at all? No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What differentiates believers like you and I from the heathen world where we live in is thanksgiving. We pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize that all of these gifts are from God and to receive our daily bread, whatever form it comes in, with thanksgiving. For all of this is our responsibility, our grateful response to thank and praise and serve and obey him. And so Jesus teaches us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread is the food of affliction. It's the food of a fallen, sinful mankind. The word bread often refers to the entire economy or work by which sinful men and women must now be nourished in a world that's cursed by sin. It was awfully different in the Garden of Eden before Genesis chapter 3. There Adam and Eve could eat freely of the fruit of the trees of the garden, fruits and nuts, embryonic life, and man and woman fed off of life, not death. Nothing had to die in order for them to feed themselves, and in fact, they were fed directly by God's own hand, by what he had grown. But when they began to take things into their own hands, when they started not listening to God's word anymore and listened to another word, when they began to worry whether or not God was holding out on them or withholding from them whatever it was that that slithery serpent had insisted that he was doing. They reached out into the middle and across the boundary to take a food that had not been given. And man and woman fell into death. And with the fall, food could no longer be obtained directly from a fallen creation. Now food would come indirectly through the working of a cursed ground. Uncooperative soil needs to be tilled. Cultivated crops need to be guarded against plants that are not food, thorns and thistles. And we know the burden that comes by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. Bread now means work. Grain needs to be harvested, separated, milled, kneaded, baked. Bread is basic. Crushed grain and water kneaded into loaves, baked in fire, and with it comes our sweat in the tilling and the planting and the harvesting and the milling and the kneading and the baking. Our sweat is for us a sort of sacramental sign of our sin and death. Sin, sinful people get nourished and sustained by the hand of God, though, as he enables us to earn a living by our work. St. Paul reminds us If anyone doesn't work, neither should he eat. Catechism reminds us that everything about bread has to do with the sport and the needs of the body. And so Luther gives you one of his famous lists of things that includes food and drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods. I like especially the way he ends it, and the like. But let's take a look at these just for a moment. Bread is family life. Family being the fundamental unit of Mankind living in community. 
It includes devout husband and devout wife and devout children. Bread is also all about economic life. It represents the economic community in which we have a role and a place in bringing the produce of the ground to each and every member of the community where we live. It includes devout workers, devout and faithful rulers and good government. If there's going to be bread, the order of creation needs to be maintained. And so this petition leads us to pray for bread in such a way that bread is also a prayer for good weather, for peace, for health, for self-control, for good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. And Luther rightly says that out of this one petition, you could make a very long prayer enumerating with many words all of the things that that one word bread includes. And so Jesus teaches us, give us this day our daily bread. We pray that God would grant us food and clothing and shelter, that he would preserve our families from the evils of divorce or drugs or drunkenness or disobedience, that he would cause our economy to prosper and give us productive labor for our hands. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray for rulers and authorities, whether they are part of our particular political persuasion or not, that through whatever the government is, God would grant us peace and protection. We pray for our communities, that sinners, though we all are, we might learn to live together in peace and concord and obedience so that our neighbors all might have their daily bread. We pray with Daily bread for protection. Protection against flood and drought, famine, fire, poison, pollution, pestilence, hail, wind. We pray against wicked and greedy employers who lay off workers for their own profit. We pray against lazy and complacent workers who do not sweat an honest day's work for the daily bread. We pray against anarchy and rebellion and violence and bloodshed. We pray for the poor, those who through, through no fault of their own have been given to be given to by those who have more than a day's worth of bread. We pray that the hearts of the rich among us would be opened wide and that those who have barns that are already filled with grain would not try to build bigger barns and bank accounts to store their surplus as the rich fool did, but would deposit their excess and the empty mouths of the poor and the hungry among them. Jesus teaches us to pray for those things, even though our Heavenly Father knows that we need them and provides them even to the most wicked of men. Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread so that we might realize that God is the giver of every good gift that we've received, and everything that comes from his fatherly hand comes purely out of goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in us. For when God withdraws his hand, nothing can prosper or last for a brief second. And so we pray that God will continue to open his hand and satisfy the desire of everything, every living thing, especially satisfy our want to give him thanks and praise that we might serve and obey him. Of course, the greatest threat to daily bread is not famine or sedition or bad government or a bad economy. The greatest threat to daily bread is our inherent penchant for unbelief, our attempt to live by bread alone instead of by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God ultimately turns bread out, God's ultimate bread turns out not to be daily bread, which is here tomorrow, here today and gone tomorrow, not the manna in the wilderness that fell from heaven and fed Israel, not the miraculous even multiplication of loaves and fish that Jesus used to feed the four and the 5,000, but the ultimate bread from heaven is our Lord Jesus himself, the bread of life. As he said, the true and living bread come down from heaven, of which a person may eat and never hunger and live forever. And here, given to us in the Lord's Supper, ordinary bread is pressed into service by the word of our Lord to be at one and the same time that extraordinary bread of Christ's own body for us Christians to eat and to drink that we might find life in his name. This is why the church prays the Lord's Prayer at the altar in the liturgy of the Holy Communion. Here at the altar is the Lord's dinner table 
for the baptized, the church. There she's gathered to eat her substantial bread, the living bread that came down from heaven. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world, Jesus says, is my flesh. And so we pray together, give us this living bread from heaven. Give us to eat our share in this blessed sacrament from which we may eat today and live forever. Give us this day our daily bread, we pray. He gives himself to us for you. He offers himself for the life of the world, for your forgiveness, for your life, for your salvation. And in the strength of that bread, you and I gather together, give thanks to him, to do our daily work, whatever it is that God has given us to do, wherever it is he has given us to do it, and receive our daily bread with thanksgiving, praying, our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ to life everlasting. We continue with the singing of the next hymn. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. 
O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.